Hello, everyone, and welcome to VAC Roundtable number 58. And as we are talking and getting people up to date on what is happening in cannabis, we're very happy to share this space with Mr. Justin Streckel. Uh, he has been a um, an activist and organizer, facilitator, and one who's gone out and has put his money where his mouth is. Uh, a lot of people walk the walk, and uh, we like to talk with those people who did that walk. And uh, Justin is uh, one of the younger uh, people in cannabis. Uh, and I say it because I've been doing this 30 years, Al 40, Michael 30. But uh, give it time, Justin. You'll be here in, in no time. <laughs> uh, but I want to thank you, first of all, for joining us. And we're just going to basically, you know, start off as we usually do, uh, which is basic, simple question, which is, how did you come to cannabis? When did you first hear about it? Your first experience with it? Welcome, Justin. He's in a way. Thank, thank you guys so very much. I, I, I look around the Zoom room and I see so many familiar faces over the years. Um, and, and I'm really excited to, to be having a nice conversation. Uh, my first experience with cannabis, well, that, that I could take that question a couple of different ways. I could give you my political answer, which talks about how I got involved in the policy sphere and avoid the fact that I first smoked cannabis when I was 13 years old. Uh, I could talk about the first uh my, how my first professional experience helped was helping draft the the first ever introduced bill in the virginia senate to uh decriminalize marijuana but that would be me skipping over the fact that i nickel and dimed my way through high school and college um as as a working class kid growing up in cleveland ohio who uh was radicalized in the anti-war movement in 2003 and uh, you know, wanted to get involved in professional politics, but not having a parental basic income, I was very fortunate to have the foresight to realize I could sell marijuana and save the money. Uh, so between when I was 16 and when I was 21, I'd saved up $30,000. And that, uh, though, those ill-gotten gains, uh, and I smoked a ton of, of reefer uh, for free, and uh, those ill-gotten gains allowed me to be able to break into the world of unpaid political internships. Uh, so that way, you know, ca cannabis paid paid my rent when I interned for for Senator Brown here in Cleveland, Ohio. It paid my my expenses when I worked as uh, the youngest person, uh, here, the one of the youngest uh, youngest interns on the Obama campaign in '08, and then later uh, it paid my rent in Washington D.C. When I was an intern at the White House in 09. So uh, cannabis has been very interconnected with with my whole political trajectory. But professionally, I, I worked on political campaigns for about a decade. And then I worked on campaign finance reform and tax policy issues for a few years. And uh, then then I was recruited in, into the cannabis policy reform movement. Here I here I now am with only seven and a half years under my belt. So I, 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 I hope to not hit the we were talking before the show. I hope to not be working on this for 30 years. I hope to only work on it for a few more and then we can just win the damn thing and I can retire and open the, the batting cages and bar that I want to here in Cleveland. But, uh, but yeah, so it's, it's, I, I've had a really, really wonderful journey, both personally and professionally with cannabis. Well, thank you. That's uh, very in-depth as well as, you know, from, you know, starting off in your teens, you know, all worked with, through, you know, like many of us, uh, I was, um, when I was going through the military and GI Bill, of course, GI Bill just only covered the basic of my college tuition. So yes, I also subsidized uh, my existence by um, uh, selling very bad cannabis. I was fortunate to finally come around to better cannabis, but uh, I, I, I look back in shame and my friends from back in West Virginia will definitely be like, mm, yeah, you were selling crap. Uh, but, you know, I'm being honest, uh, which is uh, interestingly, because you're out of Columbus, uh, I actually had to sneak uh, away in West Virginia when Operation Green Merchant had gone down. I had to drive to Cleveland to buy my first grow lights because uh, I was growing in West Virginia. We were so afraid we went to the neighboring state out of fear to actually get that. So 
love the Ohio connection, needless to say. And yeah, yeah you've had a very fruitful seven and a half years where, <clears throat> you know, and I do hope that uh, you do uh, realize the non 30 years in this because uh, no one should have to belabor something like this their entire lives, but many of us had, but we've worked toward a turning point so that we can get there and you're one of those catalysts helping make that a reality so uh, with that uh, we're going to go to our next question which is going to uh, be from Nate Landau council member Landau thank you Justin for joining us it's a pleasure talking with you and my question is in your opinion how might the VAC position itself to work most effectively with the congressional cannabis fund well, I'll, I'll, I'll say the answer that, I, that you're not looking for in a live stream first, and then I'll go to the live stream question. Um, the, the, the real answer is, Nate, you give me a call whenever you want anything, and I'll, I'll, I got you. Um, and, but, um, you know, I, for, for context and why I, can, I feel so comfortable being flip about it, I, I helped organize the launch of the Cannabis Caucus, and I have for, for many years assisted in, in facilitating and, and ensuring their continuation and their, their strength um, and adding, you know, I, on, on behalf of the caucus, I would go and recruit and, and, and radicalize more congressional staffers to, to join its ranks um, as, as, as we had to do that slow boring of, of education and, and advocacy. Um, but on a, on, a, on a more serious note, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways that I, I think veterans could uh, and VAC in particular, could do a better job of leveraging the infrastructure that has been built over the last seven years. Um, you know, one example is, is just having, you know, and, and, and Nate, you and I were lobbying together shoulder to shoulder just a couple months ago, um, you know, but keeping that that sustained pressure, it's, it's incredibly frustrating when we see these enormous problems and we 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 know the answers. I mean, the answers are not rocket science. It's end criminalization. It's it's ensure that that uh, you know we're no longer discriminating against individuals uh, unduly for the substances. And making sure that we're treating it uh, as as part of a healthcare regime, and we're not having the VA discriminate anymore. Um, but you know, we are up against the forces that that have. Uh, been erected over you know 80 plus years now and billions and billions of taxpayer dollars spent on propaganda campaigns so it really is that that uh, slow process of having to educate one person at a time on Capitol Hill so there's never one briefing to rule them all uh, until there is and <laughs> we won't be able to assess which briefing really did the job until years later when when people are distorting for the history books as they're being written. Um, one example I really like is out of uh, is out of Canada, where it was a member of Normal Canada who had had a meeting with lowly then just uh, MP uh, Justin Trudeau years before he rose through the ranks. And they used a line where they said Al Capone would have loved it if alcohol was only decriminalized. And Apparently that line stuck with Trudeau. And years later, when, when he viewed it to his political advantage, he chose to put into his pol like his core policy agenda legalization, and they passed the A45. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think collectively, thanks to tens of thousands of activists and advocates and 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 patients and veterans and um, you know, and doctors and so many others who who have really put in the shoe leather and the elbow grease and the blood, sweat and tears um, to to change this cultural moment from 1971 when 12% of the public supported legalization to today, where depending on the poll you look at, we're anywhere between 70 or 67 and 73%. Um, we are now at that moment. And the question is, is, is which of our elected officials are in the right positions to meet that moment. And we're so fortunate that the Cannabis Caucus as a vehicle to, to be that kind of uh, beachhead, if you will. And so anytime uh, you guys want, you know, man, some of you are already on the distribution list that gets the monthly minutes from the meetings, you know, if and when you guys have things that you want to give report backs on, you can do it always, you know, but personal stories are the way to go. And 
uh, I know it can be expensive and time consuming to organize those capital trips, but they, they truly are uh, the only way that we're going to win over hearts and minds. Uh, I have a follow up regarding uh, that discussion. <clears throat> uh, the VAC has actually been on Capitol Hill uh, twice in the last year. And of course, you, you were with our group, I think, the uh, second time we were there. Uh, we've actually, uh, at the behest of the uh, NCIA, went specifically after the uh, chairs and co-chairs on the Judiciary, um, Armed Services and Veterans <coughs> Affairs, uh, as well as the Cannabis Caucus. Would there be any other specific committees that you might suggest we start um, yes. applying pressure to and toward? Yes, 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 yes. Um, so there is the uh, Senate Health Committee, which was recently uh, just taken over by Chairman uh, Chairman Sanders. I like to joke. Um, I got jokes. I got all kinds of weird DC jokes. Uh, so Chairman Sanders runs one, runs health education, labor, and pensions. So that's healthcare. Um, Senator Sanders has has long been a champion for cannabis policy reform. He was the first U.S. senator to ever introduce a bill that would end prohibition. Um, you know, his staffers are, are ready to be radicalized and they just, you know, a, a lot of times, let me take a step back for a second. A lot of times we as advocates or, uh, or the, the very fortunate few who have like, like myself who somehow cobble together a way to pay the mortgage while doing this. Um, you know, a lot of our job is in, in a weird way is almost like playing therapist to the, the, the members of Congress and, and their staffs who are trying to engage in this because it, it's, it's a scary thing. It's not a slam dunk. It's still a very foreign conversation, um, you know, outside of the, the, what's considered the Overton window on Capitol Hill. And it's our job to change that. And, and part of our job is to make them feel comfortable to do so. So uh, back to your question, the health committee, the appropriations committee, money, 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 money. We recently saw a lot of changes in the leadership of the appropriations uh, committees on both the House and the Senate side, um, it, and it's a new day. One of one of the biggest uh, biggest cases of reefer madness on Capitol Hill was Richard Shelby, the Republican senator from Alabama. He uh, he is now gone, and it was because of him that uh, they ripped out uh, pro uh, amendments that we had gotten a couple of times. So. In divided government, I'm not going to promise just because Shelby's gone, everything's, you know, justice isn't going to flow like a manna from heaven. But um, but we have a much better shot now than than we have when when he was uh, the leader of the Republican Senate Approach Committee. So appropriations, also on appropriations, one of our biggest adversaries is is uh, the ranking member for the subcommittee of the Milcon VA appropriations, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who... If this is news to any of you, then 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 I am then then you know you might be late to the party, but at least we're getting here. Uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz is is truly one of the most absurd members of Congress when it comes to marijuana reform, and she is one of the most integral when it comes to veterans' intersections with cannabis through her role as what they refer to as the cardinal um, for uh, for the the leading Democrat on the Milcon VA appropriations. Um, and she is she and her team have fought us tooth and nail and told me things that are are just absolutely egregious, heinous lies. Um, so, so you know, I I don't know if we can ever convert her her cold heart, but um, you know, somehow, some way, we have to build up the political impetus to overcome her absurdity on on the Milcon VA sub appropriation subcommittee. I see another hand. Yes, Council Member Soul. Two things, um, funding while you were on the appropriations, um, question about funding and also, is Debbie the one that we met with when, that's where I remember you from is DC, I was in DC. Did we meet with Debbie from the VA committee? Is she the one? No, okay, so funding, how do we, um, would the appropriations committee be the, uh, how do we ask for more funding for research and for, um, state, federal, everything for VA research. Even I work with a neuroscientist up in Ann Arbor, VA. So mm -hmm. I know he needs more money for research, for funding for uh, medical cannabis and psilocybin, psilocybin, um, all kinds of stuff. So would that be the proper committee, or how do we go about that? Uh, I, I wish I could tell you it was the proper committee. 
Um, but but usually with appropriations, there there has to already be a statutory authority to spend money, and we need to authorize a statutory authority. Um, and you know we we could get real creative and weird and probably come up with an appropriations language, which I'm happy to nerd out not on a live stream. I mean, we could do it now, but we would take the rest of the time. And, and I know that some of y'all got questions that you really want to ask. Um, but, but I mean, when it comes to appropriations, you know, I've been pounding down the goddamn hall with the Congress talking about uh, the policy known as Veterans Equal Access, which just is simply it's a funding restriction. We're trying to get the government to say we're not going to spend money to take action against VA doctors who fill out a state legal piece of paper. And, and we couldn't even get her to agree to that, despite the fact that she represents an area that, that has medical cannabis and has veterans and has veterans who benefit from state legal Florida. I mean, Florida doesn't have the best medical cannabis, but like they benefit from that legal system. And, um, so there's that there, there is a bill to, to your, your much more important question. Um, can we authorize that additional funding, right? Or, or any funding. Um, there is a medical uh, VA uh, research act that unfortunately there, there was some shenanigans played in the Senate about two months ago. Uh, we were pretty confident we had the votes. And, um, you know, all, all of you are familiar with the filibuster and the fact that even though Democrats are in control, you still need 60 votes. And I mean, at least all 51 Democrats need to show up and at least nine Republicans are some combination to get to 50. And um, a couple who we thought, a couple of Republicans that we thought were going to be yes votes on Senator Tester's bill. Uh, he's a Democrat out of Montana who's carrying the bill. Uh, they thought they were going to, we thought they were going to vote for it. They, they had told us that they were going to vote for it. And um, because this is Washington, D.C., because it's, it's, it's professional politics, they, uh, they flipped their votes because they didn't want to give Senator Tester a political win when he is up for re-election next year and he's one of the most vulnerable Democrats to be defeated by a Republican. So um, the forces of national polarization and, and partisanship, uh, you know, we, we are not exempt from them. If anything, we, we are impacted by them to a greater degree. Um, often, you know, for, for programs that you like, they're protected by gridlock. Uh, for us, we want to affirmatively change something. So, so that means the gridlock is is that much harder for us. All right. Well, as we move on to our next question, it will be actually council member Kendra Soul. So go ahead, Kendra. So I'm here again. Um, I would like to say I am outside in the cornfields of Toledo, Ohio. So I was born and raised in Ohio, uh, left for the military, came back. Uh, you would see cornfields behind me if it wasn't blurred. You may hear a train. However, my, our question is, if you were the head of a national cannabis group, what would you try to do? Uh, uh, so first off, Ohio Solidarity greetings from Cleveland. Uh, those trains that you hear, I, I, I live three houses, uh, three lots away from the train, so I hear them as well. Um, yeah, uh, so, you know, I mean, I guess I kind of am the head of a national cannabis group um, after, and I know we're going to talk about this in a little bit, um, but I, I served for five years as the national political director and federal lobbyist for Normal, and, and I left there at the beginning of 2021, and I set up a new, uh, a new entity called Better Organizing to Win Legalization and a PAC called Bowl PAC. Um, so as so, I'm going to reframe the question as the head of a group. Uh, you know, in my in my view, uh, you know what, what we're doing is really hard. You know, I, I I was a partisan hack for a long time. I worked for Democrats to get them elected, but I often worked and lost in Democratic primaries, working for the underdog. Um, you know, but if we're ever the number sixty keeps me up at night, and and when, when you know, I think. It's, it's more likely that we're going to abolish the U.S. Senate than we're going to abolish the filibuster. And the, the, the political scientist in me uh, has really mixed feelings about the, the idea of abolishing the filibuster in general. I think it, it you know, there, there could be short-term gains but in, in public policy, but I think it would also present some really hazardous long-term uh, implications like the dismantling of Social Security or Medicare. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, but the, so yeah, so the number 60 keeps me up at night. So I've been working really, really hard to try to forge consensus. And I'm so fortunate to be as, as, as some of my conservative colleagues refer to me as their trust, their trusted lefty. 
um, because I, I always come with receipts for every single claim I make. I'll always tell it to you straight, and 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 I, you know, I, I try to at least be entertaining uh, before they say no to me. So they they keep letting me come back into their offices um, and and try again. Um, and slowly but surely, it's 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 like water over rock. We're gonna grind them down. Um, but you know, there, there, there's a lot of different needs, right? And uh, you know, I used to be an organizer with Occupy Wall Street, and one of our favorite lines was, you know, we support a diversity of tactics. So that way, I'm not saying I'm gonna go use a bicycle lock to chain my neck to 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 this thing. But if you choose to do so, then you know what, so be it, right? And and because it all calls attention to the cause and and you know, so it just it really depends on on you know what roles we need people to play to do a better job of raising the various aspects. You know, I've been talking with, with Michael Krauts for, for years. Um and you know, we, we I agree with him on so many things, I disagree with him on a couple things. Um, and, and yet, you know, if only because he reaches out to me, it forces me to think about it in my day to day, uh, because the most precious, the most precious commodity in, in, in any state, state capital, U S capital, city council, whatever, the most precious commodity in, in any kind of uh, legislative body is attention. And there is no way in hell. They are going to remember your meeting from two years ago if you haven't followed up with them six different times to remind them of what you told them. Uh, or as, as my grandfather always says, you know, go in there, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them you told them, right? And, and we just have to keep showing up and, and um, make sure that we have open lines of communication and collaboration and solidarity with one another. Excellent. <clears throat> All wise words, sir. Uh, next up will be council member Michael Krowitz. Oh, uh, here's here's the one. Here 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 here's the kneecap. Uh -oh. Yeah, yeah, man. It's good to see oh, you. Uh, and so and I think that you, that's actually uh, military doctrine. I believe the at least I learned that in the military. Uh, military style. You lay it out in the outline, and you put it in the middle of the speech, and then you wrap up in the summary and say it again three times. So. Yeah, that way maybe maybe they hear you once. But uh, this question is particularly important from Veterans Action Council perspective, because uh, many to most of us are medical patients. We're using cannabis as a medicine, uh, a palliative in in most cases. Um, the the adult rec markets have uh, not necessarily served all interests of, of patients and uh, in, in, the, in the pursuit and the effort to create adult rec markets has in many cases interfered with medical cannabis programs. Um, so, you know, with that kind of backdrop, uh, the question is, as the former political director and lobbyist of normal, you understand how we are witnessing an evolving cannabis environment with more states legalizing medical and recreational use. Ensuring patient access is and safety is of paramount importance in this changing landscape. Can you please outline the specific initiatives and strategies that you think groups like Normal or others should implement to guarantee improved patient access to cannabis for medical purposes, uh, while also protecting consumers and ensuring safety? Now, this, uh, you know, when, when we were talking a little bit before, and I got a preview that we were going to touch on this subject, you know, I, I, I've, I've given it a bit of thought. And it's, it's an incredibly challenging issue that we have ahead of us when, we, when we're talking about medical patients and, and, and this very, very dynamic and versatile substance, right? And, and one of the challenges that, that I always try to just remind myself so I can stay sane is, is how much morality do we expect out of a, a system that is built on the capital incentive? And when, you know, so the question is, is how, how can we as advocates or how can, how can we as patients or how can we as, you know, insert whatever collective you want to refer to yourself as, um, how, how do we try to influence those who are in this, who, to change the ways that they're doing something when they're only doing that thing to make money, right? And, and is there ethical consumption in, during late stage capitalism? I don't know, but if you put it in Google, the answer is no. 
And um, so it's, it's an incredibly challenging thing. Um, so I, I think when it comes to, when it comes to uh, what can advocacy groups do, you know, one, one individual who, uh, who I look to as, as someone who I think is just a, a great example for local action is, is um, friend Eric Opel who is a board member of LA Normal. He's also with, uh, with he's got his own veterans group called the Veterans Cannabis Collective, Collaborative, I forget, VCC. Um, I knew it was a C. Coalition. Um, Coalition. Coalition. I got, see, I, third time's the term. Uh, the, the, the rule of three thing, yeah, my grandfather picked that up when he was in the Air Force. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what they did is, is you know, with the passage of a compassion donation program in California that affords companies an incentive for a tax write-off for donating product, then then he works very hard with a lot of other folks. I know there's um, Sean with Weed for Warriors, Sean Kiernan, who does this as well, um, and, and a number of others. So I, you guys do it. I don't, forgive me, I haven't... Um, Every time I talk to them, they remind me every single time. It's the first thing. Like, let me tell you how many, you know, how many pounds we just moved. Um, and I've yet to, so you're going to, you're next on stack to tell me, to give me your overview. Um, is, but, you know, but it, it's, it's utilizing the incentive structure of the, of the business, which is, you know, the, it's not like the businesses are, are, are donating what, what just came off the, the crop. It's, oh, this stuff's about to expire uh, according to our labeling and, and regulation. So let's, let's just get it off the shelf and, and that way we get the tax right off, right? Um, so, you know, there, there, there are pathways that we can go to try to do that. As far as developing better medical, um, uh, medical delivery practices, I think that absolutely has to come with government intervention, and that's that's direct government funding for private research as well as direct government funding for for public research at, at universities, and and at universities that engage in partnerships with, frankly, organizations like yours, right? Where and and that's the only way that I think we're truly going to be able to get uh, when when we talk about product variety and and product development. Uh, it's got to come from public funding um, because the private sector does not have the incentive structure or the motivation structure because the cost of engaging in that is not worth the 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 press that they're going to get off of it in their view. Um, so, you know, it's 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 and, and the only way that we're going to get that those kind of that real research done is is once we end prohibition because even the the the, the incredibly meager crumbs that that was the research bill that was passed in the previous congress or the research bill that we were just discussing by senator tester it's it's really not going to unleash the dynamism that is uh is is you know the the uh, the capacity of the american researcher when their hands are so arbitrarily tied by by politicians in dc who wanted to sneak provisions in there just so that way they could beat their chest and they say, oh, look, I'm protecting the public because we're only going to let them research these four provisions and we're only going to do this and things like that. So uh, I hope that I hope that substantively addressed your question. Uh, if I missed anything, please let me know. Uh, I'm going to clarify just for a second. VAC does not give away cannabis, but Berkeley Patients Group has. Got it. Does. Oh, BPG, uh, yeah. Yes, as well as Brian Buckley does with uh, his uh, Battle Brothers Foundation, as well as with Helmand Valley Growers Association. So, yes, uh, and, and it's very sad that, unfortunately, California is the only state that does this currently. And we hope to see that flow outward for more people because yeah. uh, it's very beneficial because, unfortunately, the cost of cannabis is still so prohibitively high, and especially to our veterans, who are on fixed incomes due to disability, the cost is outrageous. So, you know, we're working, you know, on things specifically there for change, but nor here nor there. Um, but thank you for your statement there. Yeah. Council member Krawitz has a follow-up and then we have another follow-up after that. Yeah, I think you nailed the, the question. I have a follow-up actually, as you were talking, um, uh, the organizations that you mentioned, and then I can name a few more, like Americans for Safe Access or Veterans Cannabis yes. Project, for example. Um, the, 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 I'll, I'll not 
say which of the organizations of those five or six that we talked about that I'm speaking specifically to, but I'll ask this question in, in, in their uh, honor. And that is, we're a Veterans Action Council is a completely voluntary group of uh, essentially a stakeholder representative group from your perspective. And uh, uh, we're, we're you know, kind of loosely uh, uh, aligned with the, the principles of like that somewhere between the you know the knights of the round table and the lions club <laughs> or something like that but uh but anyway uh we we uh can do whatever we want and we we do some pretty cool stuff and we get some stuff done and, and it's really great we have a really interesting lay of the land the perspective that we have is pretty in interesting and rather unique and from our perspective in in those groups that we just mentioned it, it seems like there's choices that are made and the, the choices are simple do the thing whatever it is, change the world, you know, create access for medicine, stop death, destruction, mayhem, you know, and suicide, whatever you want to take a chunk out of that, you do that, or you can fundraise around that, on that, for that, endlessly in this, in this environment. We're in a, a really bad moment for these uh, organizations to try to fund, or uh, you can promote, <laughs> endlessly promote, which is the promotion is somewhat linked to the fundraising. Uh, now that I'm saying it out loud, but, um, you know, how do you navigate that? How do you, what, what do you suggest in, in this, you know, I mean, it, it, we, it's been contended in our meetings that the era of the not-for-profit cannabis organization is over, you know, so how do you answer that, basically? I mean, I, I, I think you're in, in large part very right when you say the era of the non-profit cannabis organization is over. Um, you know, I, from, from my experience, uh, looking at this from a national vantage point, much of the resources that, that were generated in support of these organizations, be it, be it normal, be it the Drug Policy Alliance and, 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 and MPP in like in the nineties, uh, that, that both started because they, they viewed normal as not doing enough. Well, with DPA it was, they were taking on the whole goddamn drug war, but um, you know, MPP was explicitly started uh, because uh, the the founder who worked at Normal was frustrated with Normal, left Normal, and said, "I'm going to go start my own thing." And only one of those organizations had a good fundraiser. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't Normal. Um, but that that was the '90s. That was way before my time. Um, but a lot of that money came from from philanthropic donors. Um, you know, Peter B. Lewis was a huge one. Hugh Hefner. Uh, basically supported, you know, the incubation of normal and, and sustained it like, you know, so it was playboy money supporting uh, and, and a lot of, you know, and just a lot of like, uh, you know, just intersectional solidarity support kind of stuff, right? Um, there, there was a lot of money from, from um, you know, producers of sex toys, right? Um, that, that supported normal uh, in, in the 70s and 80s and 90s and I think even to this day. Um, but it, it's much less now than it used to be. Uh, but today, there, that philanthropic funding, um, the, those regular structures have largely moved away. And this is, this is a result of the success of, of the legalization movement and the inevitability that is now anticipated. So when the, these philanthropic donors are realizing, oh, or they're thinking, oh, Marijuana is going to happen anyway. Now there's this big industry. Let's let the industry pay for it. My dollar, my my philanthropic dollars are going to be better spent doing other things. Um, and and there's a certain level of truth in that, and there's a certain level of self deceit in that. And um, you know, and when when we look at the industry side of things, again, you know, going back to my previous the the, the previous question I posed, like how much morality do we anticipate when, when we're talking about the capital incentive? And, and this is why we see a lot of, of the industry sponsored initiatives and the industry sponsored lobbyists pushing for, you know, hyper restrictive limited licensing structures. So that way they can set up their own fiefdoms and not have competition. Uh, we, we see, you know, as states seek to switch from medical to adult use provisions where only the medical operators have, have a stranglehold on all of the licenses for a period of time. Or there's there's an intention to set up a, an additional licensing process, but then the industry lobbies against that for that to not be enacted. I mean, you know, it's just it's it's difficult because you can't you you know movements aren't free, um, but you know, and 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 I, I I felt 
the burden of, of the responsibility. And it's one of the reasons why I chose to leave normal is, is the responsibility that, that I felt to the movement and the lack of resources and support that I was able to obtain from the previous executive director. Um, just, it, it, it was something that was profoundly challenging, which is why I chose to leave and set up my own shop so I could focus on what I'm really good at um, and, and be able to you know freelance it on my own. Um, so it's, it's really challenging, Michael. And I don't think that there, there is no cavalry coming to save us. Um, you know, it, it, I mean, unless, unless anybody here knows any really, really, really moral, ethical billionaires, um, who, who's just going to come be the movement sugar daddy and, and write us checks so that way we can all pay our mortgages and get healthcare and, and, and I've been looking for one. I couldn't find one. What was that? I'm just kidding. I said, I've been looking for one. I can't find one for us. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I'm, I'm looking forward to, but you know, in, 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 in my experience, you know, somehow, some way, I hope that we're going to muddle through, right? But um, it's, it, it truly is a muddling process, and, and it's, it's the slow – nobody likes fundraising. I mean, I think, I think the movement needs more fundraisers, period. Like, I, I've had to grow a lot as a person just in the last two years to, to be able to raise the money, and I've been really fortunate to have a few people and organizations who believe in me to donate to my C4 – and you know and then some great partners who helped me spin up a hundred thousand person email list to raise you know a few thousand dollars here and there for my pack um to just go play in some politics but there there i wish i had a much better answer at this point i'm just filibustering because i don't have a better answer for you and um i i think i think your summation is right i think i think the the era of the big nonprofit is dead but the question is what is going to be done with with the assets and and how can how can the momentum be leveraged and 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 still directed in the most pro people way possible and while simultaneously fending off the worst instincts of 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 the rise of the industry lobbyists well on top of that that any of the solid people etc either were moved on or too busy and involved in industry that they no longer do activism and i think we're suffering from a great lack of activists uh because they've all kind of taken their ball and gone home to a certain extent and uh there is a lack of good communicators out there and available that were available five ten years ago in dc that are it's no longer applicable i don't know if you would agree with that or not i i think I think we one thing I want to keep in mind here is, is is also just a mismanagement of expectations. I think that it is it is very easy for us to sit here and 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 shoot the shit and talk about the good old days or or, or whatever. Um, but it's very very difficult for for me as a younger person. You know, I'm only 34 years old. Um, I I got my uh, on the internet on America Online in, in 1994 for the first time, and I haven't turned back since. Um, you know, for me to maintain my attention span and 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 that perspective, uh, because yeah, you know, actually, you know, I I think of it as the aggravated assault on our attention spans, um, and and it's so easy to expect more faster. Um, and, and we have unrealistic, unrealistic expectations, not only of, of others, but of ourselves too. You know, we, we think about some of the, these great leaders in American history. If we followed their Twitter accounts and with, with the same veneration that we have for them today, we start following their Twitter accounts, we'd be fucking pissed off. At, excuse, I don't know if I should be, if I can swear here, but we, we, yeah. we'd be very disappointed in them two months from now because we're like, why haven't they accomplished more great things in just the last two months, right? Um, so I try very, very hard, and I do a lot of, I smoke a lot of weed to maintain that kind of perspective and 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 serenity as as I'm assessing the value and efficacy of of my my uh, fellow ad, advocates, activists. Um, you know, I, I've been accused of, of of not being righteous enough. Uh, by people in every aspect of the space, but if I if I let those things try to stop me, then then I would have stopped a long time ago. And um, maybe maybe some people think that that would be a good thing. Councilmember Byrne, you've been patient. You have a follow up. 
Yeah, uh, I can see they're smiling. Uh, after hearing this conversation, I know why I wrote my book. Uh, I, I, the stuff I've been hearing here is beyond my uh, ability to absorb. Uh, the reason I rose my hand, uh, by the way, the guy that left normal work for me, his name was was Rod Camp here. When he left, he took the mailing list from normal and we paid $10,000 to the girl that he uh, that accused him of sexual harassment. That's the guy that went on and started MPP. And then when he was in MPP, he went 30 days to a treatment plant for sexual harassment. I don't, I don't, I don't hold those guys up as uh, role models. Yeah. Uh, but what you said bothered me about research my studies over these years is that cannabis is the most researched plant in the world. Now, what you're talking about, and what all the, the stones in Washington who can't think at all are talking about is U.S. research. Right. The other right. word for that kind of thought process is hubris. Uh, there is a good bit of U.S. research now, nothing like what the world contains. Uh -huh. It's been over 15 years now that my organization, and I'm the only one here that ever re re uh, ran a national nonprofit, run three of them. And uh, my organization put together uh, over 100,000 pages of peer-reviewed literature on cannabis as a medicine. But a lot of it came from overseas, you know, backwards places like Spain and the United Kingdom and Australia. So the research available is, uh, it's just a sentence I can't tolerate. Wait, wait, wait forgive uh, me. And forgive I hear me. it all the wait, time. Go ahead. Go ahead. Forgive me. I want to clarify, clarify, because I think I, because I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying now. And if I may clarify my, my previous remarks, I was referring to product development uh, for, for additional medical applications. Not not research of efficacy or impact, but but specifically talking about product development for for uh, different types of use of medical application. So, so, so I, yeah, with I, all due respect, I so, yeah, no, I, I think we're on the same level as as far and, and yeah. I similarly have beaten my head. When right, I'm, but but part of our responsibility here at the BAC is to make sure that our audience. Yeah. understands what the language is and what we're really referring to. So that's why I'm bringing this up. Uh, well, I'm, I'm grateful. I would say this about the legislative process. These guys know I'm a, I guess I could say I'm even a contrarian to that uh, because I've watched guys like you for about 50 years now uh, go to Congress federally and have no effect at all. Uh, but education with the medical community started, say, 20 years ago, has changed the whole concept of what we're doing. So, uh, you know, that's just a, a comment from the side. And I'll leave my, I know I, I'm not supposed to be talking now, but I have to say something to everybody involved. We've been talking now for 35, 40 minutes. You know, I've never heard the word, I haven't heard this word yet. Plant. It's a fucking plant audience and and what is the problem here is when you go to the congresses whether they're in a state house or the federal level these people up there think drug it's not a drug it's a plant deal with it as a plant from which yes you can make drugs different program i'm sorry please go on no, you're, 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 you're all great. And I appreciate you, you bringing up the issue in research so I, I can clarify, because we are in complete agreement. I, I, I really get frustrated when people talk about we need more research as if we don't know what the substance does. And, and I was only talking about things about developing new um, medical applications to, to, to treat people, because um, I don't think that the private market is going to invest in that. At least not to the degree that people deserve. Right. Well, thank you for that clarification, gentlemen. Uh, next up will be Council Member Wade Laughter. Council Member Laughter.
Yes, thank you, Tim, and uh, thank you, Justin, for joining us today. Um, yeah, in listening to your conversation, uh, since you've joined us here this afternoon, uh, you've made several references to the history of normal, if you will, from its founding through to your involvement with it. Um, and I, I'm going to kind of reframe the question that we originally presented to you. Um, uh, as you've also commented, resources have gotten much harder for any sort of national organization on a nonprofit basis in the cannabis space. Um, given the checkered history, if you will, of, of, of normal up until now, uh, in terms of actually affecting the changes that we're seeking, um, I'm sort of wondering, here's the thing, Veterans Action Council, we're, we are mission driven. Uh, part of part of being in the military is getting the mission and learning how to accomplish it. And to Al's observations, you know, for 50 years, he's watched folk go to these various legislators and try to affect the changes that we're seeking, which is basically access for all. It's right there in our byline, right under our name, Veterans Action Council, access for all. And to Al's point, it's a plant. I've worked with the plant for going on 30 years professionally now. And my focus has always been patience. And to me, that might be the new mission for normal. Back in the day, it was helping people who got busted stay out of jail or prison time. But maybe now it's helping ensure access for people who actually need cannabis, not enjoy it. That's allowed too, but really, yeah, that's my personal mission in the Veterans Action Council, to seeing everyone having access to this plant if they want it or need it, but especially for those who need it. And I think it's just as big a deal as when people were put and put, being put in jail or prison or having their goods stolen or et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so if I was gonna formulate the question, why would, I, why would I choose to support the national? I don't think I've ever sent money to the national. I, I've been a longtime friend of Dale Geringer and Ellen Kopp here in California. And I've seen some pretty good results there and I do send them money. Uh, what little of it I make, because again, I, I'm a patient advocate and for years my model has always been give it away. And if you need it, something will come to cover what you need. And um, yeah, that's been my model for a bunch of years. So where, where would I send my resources? What precious resources I have access to, Tessin? Thank you for your time. And I know that's not an easy question. No, no, it's, 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 it's not an easy question, but it's, I think, the right question. And uh, one of, you know, I, I didn't get my start, you know, when, when I was younger, and, and I'm going to go get involved in politics. Uh, I didn't think that, you know, a decade later, I'd be a cannabis lobbyist, right? I, I didn't think I'd be running around where, you know, running around the halls of Congress wearing a little gold leaf pin, um, and often getting confused for a Canadian. Um, I, I, I think, but your, your question really strikes to the heart of the issue, which is how are we going to get things done and who, who are the people who are coming up with not just the strategy, but, but the, the chutzpah and the dynamism and, and the tenacity and the effectiveness to get it done. And, and I think that when it comes to normal, one of the challenges of normal is that it is such a such a dynamic institution and, and brand that it is very easy for people to project assumptions upon to it. Um, and, and when the organization hasn't been able to have a disciplined message as far as what the organization even does, uh, it, it can be very it's very prone to letting people down. Um, one one of my thoughts as 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 someone who does federal advocacy and and, law, and work is the most dangerous thing I can do is mismanage somebody's expectations, and I think we we exist in this era now where you know thinking back to my my comments about uh, the aggravated assault on our attention spans and our inability to hold perspective and context for for how quickly and how slowly things are changing. Um, you know, I, I, I think I would advise you to answer your direct question. I would advise you to continue supporting Ellen and continue supporting Dale because they do phenomenal work. 
and and it's my and I was always so incredibly grateful when when they would come out to Washington D.C. for the lobby days and the conferences that I would organize, um, and and I I could trust them, and when when I organized meetings with then Speaker Pelosi's office. Uh, I knew that I could bring Gail with me, right? I knew that I could bring them because we had built a relationship. We had built a solidarity. And I, and, and uh, unlike many other young people, I had the audacity to listen to them um, and, and take my time with them and not just be waiting for my turn to speak. So I, I, would, I think my answer to your direct question uh, is, is continue supporting California Normal. I know that that they they have accomplished tremendous things um and it is very difficult for them to continue to put together the resources to represent the growing list of issues that that still need to get addressed in legalization in many ways we we are burdened by our own successes because every time we get a w we we get another five things on our to-do list and every time we get a w people give us a nice little pat on the back and they say good job no, 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 no. What can I do next? No, where can I write the check to support the, the continuation of, of the journey that, that we as, 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 as folks who have the audacity to advocate uh, choose to walk? Uh, so it's, it's a really challenging thing. I think when, when I think about normal in general, you know, I, I, I would joke. Uh, you know, that's an organization that had one previous executive director who would say all use is medical use and another previous executive director who said medical marijuana is a bullshit red herring and another previous executive director who got the drugs are fired because he did cocaine with them, right? Um, you know, it's it's a very challenging banner to pick up. And, um, you know, I, I had a lot of folks uh, come at me uh, during my tenure who had been around the movement for a long time and hold me responsible for, for the sins of normal staffers past. Um, but I, I tried to have great empathy and understanding from the perspective they were coming from. Uh, because I really, really, you know, if anything, because that, that every other week phone call of somebody calling up and saying Keith Strop ruined everything by, by going after Peter Bourne, because that call would come into the national office like every other week somebody would call uh, you know, right? um but that but i think that undercuts you know it undercuts the good things that that leaders of that organization have done over 53 years um and and keith to his credit he he was willing to step up and 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 put his face on an issue when it was very unpopular um you know i often joke when it comes to politics don't have heroes uh, because because we we are all just people, and and on a long enough of a timeline, you you will be disappointed by anyone. Um, so, but uh, I, I I think the best bang for your buck is local organizing. Period. Right. Uh, just period. Full stop. End of story. I I I always think whenever people would come to me with new ideas to pitch at the federal level, I say, okay, where are the proofs of concept? What receipts can I take into a congressional office to say, hey, I would like for you to stick your neck out and write this new bill because uh, it's a great idea. And they say, okay, well, how do I know that it's a great idea? Do you have any examples of it? And if you don't have state or local examples of it, then, then you know, I'm walking in there and just asking them to not take me seriously, asking them to say, hey, you know, you have no credibility. Um, so it's, it's, you know, getting those wins to going back to the point about California, um, California's compassionate donation program. Yeah, I've heard of other activists who are trying to get those passed in other states. And the only reason that any of those other states are going to pass is because of California and, and because of the hard work that, that you and so many others have done, uh, to, to, to redistribute the expiring weed, right? Um, so I, I hope that answers your question in a satisfactory way. Well, interestingly enough, the next question is coming to you from a former head of National Normal. <laughs> Council member Al Byrne. <laughs> Justin, it's not personal. I know it's not. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to tell you that if you really want a great book on early uh early years of normal you want to get high in america by patrick anderson 
Uh, I bought it just the other day on, on a used book thing for 20, 30 bucks. And again, if you're in that, in that genre that you're in, uh, you probably would be helped by that. Yeah. I think you find uh, some of your heroes maybe weren't. Uh, oh, I don't. Have I didn't write that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I would recommend that to you. Then I'd recommend my book uh, for country and cannabis. It just came out because I pick up where Anderson left off with normal, and there were a lot of characters there then who were very uh, unfavorable in various ways. Uh, I think you'll find that book very informative about a lot of your heroes. <laughs> So uh, I, I, anyway, I, I, do not, uh, I do not like what I was just accused of because I do not appreciate being accused of having heroes because I do not. Well, <laughs> and, no. any 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 belief in in in, in having heroes almost died. Nobody, in a long almost time. nobody knows what I, I knew about those years, and that's why I wrote the book. But yeah. uh, as far as the, the uh, as the question goes, uh, we're veterans. Our focus is on, as Wade says, we want this for everybody. We're talking about everybody. But our focus is, of course, on our brothers and sisters. So uh, other than legislative uh, stuff, which is your expertise, I get it. Uh, but outside the box, you're looking at veterans and you're saying, what can these guys and girls do other than in the legislature that might affect a positive outcome? Well, it depends on risk tolerance levels, and and I never I never like to assume that that I'm aware of anybody's risk tolerance level. For and, and when I say that, I mean you know everything from you know y'all want to you know get together and, and and do things like this to to to, to, raise, to elevate the level of the conversation, to get more people engaged, to seem more accessible, to direct actions and putting yourself in arrestable positions. You know, for example, my my risk tolerance threshold, the only times I put myself in arrestable positions are usually for uh, direct actions pertaining to voting rights um, or when I was younger with Occupy Wall Street. Um, and then when I was younger, anti-war stuff. Um, I've gotten older and crasser and now I'm only going to get arrested for, for voting rights stuff. Um, but so, you know, there, there, again, I support diversity of tactics and I think everybody needs to ask themselves, you know, two questions. How righteous is your indignation and how how effective can your tactics be? And I think that there there are a lot of different audiences that still need to be addressed and and touched with with different messages. And veterans, um, the veterans community uniquely as as a messenger has a level of inherent credibility and trust that no other aspect of, of American society does anymore because everybody else has been attacked, right? There's been concerted efforts to attack every other classification and, and subgroup of Americans. We've seen it with, you know, teachers, doctors, um, uh, nurses, right? Other, other like, you know, institutions and, and professions that were weren't really, really held in high esteem universal support. You know, even recently we've seen crass attacks against them. Uh, you know, we see this with, with law enforcement as well. Um, but, you know, I think with, with veterans, the, the veterans community has a really unique opportunity to do whatever it is it chooses to do. And, you know, in, in the context, uh, earlier we were talking about veterans equal, the Veterans Equal Access uh, Amendment and an act to allow VA doctors to, to fill out legally state law, uh, state recommendation forms but you know one of the things that debbie wasserman schultz's office was trying to argue is oh it wouldn't actually protect them so they would you know those doctors would be would be um you know vulnerable to arrest uh because it doesn't def you know it doesn't restrict the funding from the doj it only does the va it's the whole thing um to which my response was i wish they would i wish they would come arrest va doctors who are filling out those recommendation forms because that's going to make the local news, which is going to then elevate the state news, which is going to then elevate to a national story, which is going to give us a two point bump in the goddamn national polls. Right. You know, what what was the catalyst for for the Obama administration implementing the coal memo? The pictures of patients being arrested and carted out of dispensaries during raids in, in California and other states. Right. So, you know, 
our our nation has a propensity to gravitate its, its attention towards violence, which is why direct action is is such a salient um, uh, form of civil of, of protest, and and why so often direct action gets the goods. I think you know I I don't ever want to suggest to anybody who shouldn't consider for themselves. Uh, putting themselves in in those positions, but I think that that would be one of your most salient um, uh, salient approaches. But yeah, I mean, just in general, there there there's the soapbox thing. There's the showing up everywhere and everywhere all the time because no one no one engagement, which you know very very well. Uh, there's no one engagement to rule them all. Um, but yeah, I I I think continuing to show up everywhere and everywhere, and and unfortunately, it feels like America. Myself included, has, has lost our, our our appetite to put our bodies on the line for for the cause of civil disobedience and protest. Uh, Council Member Peggy Jones has a question, and then Michael Krawitz. Council Member Jones. Hi, Justin. Thank you for joining us tonight. Do you have any Thank new you. ideas of avenues to approach for decriminalization that you haven't seen used anywhere before? Ooh, state, local, federal. Any of the above, Any the above. International, um, so that we can get plant medicine legalized worldwide. It, it is something yeah. that we all are aware that works. Yeah, no, that's just a question. Um, you know, I, I think one one that I don't think would be effective at the federal level, but that I think could be effective um, just in general uh, for for state levels is is through through the courts. Um, I think that there are pathways in, in some of those hard to reach 27 states that still remain now, you know, happy, happy belated Minnesota legalization day to all. Um, you know, I think that, you know, states like Idaho, right, that, that recently went so far as to try to amend their constitution to prevent ballot initiatives um, pertaining to legalizing drugs. I, you know, Idaho might be the last state to legalize cannabis uh, if, if they ever do. Um, you know, per, perhaps the courts are, are, are another way that I, I know have been tried, but I think merit a little bit more of a concert, like consideration for a concerted effort going forward that could be done by an organization like the normal legal committee. Um, you know, just an idea, uh, throwing it out there if any NLC members are listening. Um, you know, happy to talk to you about it. Uh, I, I think, no, I mean, this is one of those things where like, you know, Folks of all stripes and all different inspirations for decades have, have, have tried all different kinds of tactics. And, and there are no silver bullets here. And, um, you know, I think ultimately, while, you know, at the federal level, which is what I know most about, uh, there, there is technically a theory in that the, the, the administration could, you know, could deschedule marijuana. Um, but I, I, that hasn't happened yet. And theories are only as good as, as, as the paper of which, or, or the, the person who reads the paper. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I hate to say it. And, you know, I, 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 I intend to not become what, 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 uh, what Al foretold, foretold or council member Al foretold, uh, which, which is, I'll just be one of these guys, you know, my, I, I plan to stick around and see it through and, from my experiences as being involved in, uh, for example, I, I ran the whip operation for the first time. The uh, oh god, the name of the amendment has changed so many times. The expanded DOJ spend, uh, spending restriction, uh, building upon the existing medical protection, uh, has to cover all adult use and medical path. You know, we passed that twice now in the House of Representatives. I was the one running the whip. Um, you know, I was integral and in, in, involved in being uh, the passage of the Moore Act um, uh, back in late 2020. You know, people told us the, the, there, there was a small group of, of advocates who came together and we later organized the Marijuana Justice Coalition. Um, you know, everybody told us there was no fucking way in hell that we were ever going to pass the Moore Act. And, and they kept on telling us, no, don't do that. Get behind the States Act. And, you know, the States Act, which, which, you know, if you put a two drinks in me, I'd refer to it as the Industry Protection Act. Um, but when I was being very professional and lobbying on Capitol Hill, I would go to Republican offices and try to encourage them to co-sponsor because I thought that was the appropriate ask of, of Republican offices. 
Uh, but for Democratic offices who are willing to say they support ending prohibition, I thought it was inappropriate to ask for less. And um, we passed that bill. And, and you know, I'm, I'm proud of uh, the role that I played while at Normal. As part of that, we generated hundreds of thousands of, me of, of email messages. We generated tens of thousands of phone calls. Um, you know, even during the height of COVID, you know, we set up a, a really novel communication structure uh, to, to make sure that offices didn't forget their commitments to that they made to us during the election season and that they passed that bill in December. Um, obviously, just died in the Senate, but, um, or didn't get considered in the Senate. But, um, you know, uh, like water over rock. We're gonna come and, and earlier somebody said, you know, we didn't get here overnight. We're not gonna we're not gonna win overnight. Um, but slowly but surely. I hope that answers your question. Well, if uh, you ever get in a place, we also have two constitutional mm -hmm. challenges that uh, following Canada's rule that we've discussed with an actual yeah. constitutional lawyer that just would take us a decade and a couple million dollars and six lawyers and all that other fun stuff. But that's another avenue, and another time, and another discussion. Yes. Just six lawyers. I know, right? Isn't that that's what she said? When we, yeah, but yeah, right. Just, just, right. Yeah. <laughs> Council Member Crowitz. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's that's a viable plan uh, if you want something to do. <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, I what I'm looking for actually, while we have our thinking caps on, I think it would be a hard question, but a real easy one to answer. I think I'm looking for just a simple recommendation, uh, mm -hmm. but. What I'm talking about here is a uh, uh, Veterans Action Council, as you know, uh, working all the way back to 1998 with uh, Veterans for Compassion, I've taken it on uh, to work within the United Nations on, on cannabis policy. And only recently, like 2020, did we actually get somewhere uh, rather dramatically kind of leaping forward past the United States in a way, uh, you know, with a, a meaningful rescheduling at the international level. Um, but, um, these meetings that we attend, we're getting together our delegation. Uh, the Veterans Action Council has helped to take on a lot of the responsibilities of, uh, of leading our, our delegation, our cannabis delegation, for what it's worth, at the United Nations for the last few years, I guess three years now, two, three years. And uh, we've had side events, really incredible. Three years, yeah. And uh, uh, brought in, uh, over the years, dozens and dozens of, of, of cannabis organizations into the fold. But what I'm looking for, like, We've actually had really good, as you know, you know, just to, to just mention a couple of things that are side effect, effects of this. We've had a very close contact with our State Department, the Department of the United States Department of State, uh, also the White House, the Executive Branch uh, Office of National Drug Control Policy, has been very much open to us as part of this process. Um, you know, so given that, given that kind of access, given that kind of you know, work, uh, uh, you know, the Drug Policy Alliance is there at the UN. Uh, they've made presentations. But I, I really have to say the Drug Policy Alliance and us, all of us, are barely scratching the surface of what we could do there, of, of, of the resources and stuff that's, uh, that's possible there. And that's just looking at our country, let alone, you know, when you start talking about international stuff that you can launch from there. Um, uh, just working within the United States scope, but from there, from, from the international perspective, seems to give us access and ability that we don't have domestically. It's strange. But anyway, given all that, and given your kind of uh, you know, bird's, view, bird's eye view of the cannabis movement, who would you think we would want to bring in to, to the delegation? Who would, who would be like a one person representing an organization or a think tank or research or academia or even the industry? One person that you just say, jump, your name just jumps to mind that somebody that we would want to stick in Vienna to, to attend meetings, to, to you know, maybe answer questions, to, to be an expert on, on cannabis, or to just in general uh, help to achieve some of these really un, un, not even unachieved, they're not even um, uh, attempted. Mm. You know, there's many uh, un, uh, unattempted um, goals that could be met there. So to, to make sure I'm understanding the question correctly, basically, like, who do you want to embed in Vienna? Well, no, it, it, this is a very discreet or, or, uh, or just or just a trip. Or yeah, just the, do, well, to handle it's, the trip. It's it's, it, it's it's a longer answer, but but not much longer answer than a very short answer. And that is, it, it's just one thing. Is you know, it's essentially just one trip, like a a week long meeting. But the learning curve, I, I always say, I can't apologize for the learning curve. It's a hell of a learning curve to be ready to go to Vienna. 
uh, and to participate in these meetings. I see Nate shaking his head. Nate participated and was part of our delegation this year, and ATN is planning on attending next year. Uh, it, it is quite amazing uh, going to the show. My, uh, you know, I, I, I consider myself uh, a preacher of the book of Armentano. Um, so for, for all, all things, but, you know, I, I, I don't think he, Paul Armentano, uh, the, the current deputy director of normal, um, I don't think he, he has the foundational knowledge of, of the international, uh, provisions locked in yet, but, um, you know, one, he, he is, to quote him, he is someone who remembers what he reads. So I think if, if given the amount of time, you know, the, the, the necessary time just to know what it is he has to read and, and, and be able to do so, I, I, I would, he's, he's the first person who comes to mind uh, when I think about uh, a representative for just, just cannabis policy from an American perspective. Um, hey, this is hey, a question, Michael. I'm going to think about that some more. Let me follow up real quick on that and just say thank you so much for that answer. And uh, interestingly, if, if I were to think, you know, of the one person that could probably refute Kevin Sabet the most effectively, it would be Paul Armentano. And that's been one of our hobbies over in Vienna because Kevin Sabet uh, plays an outsized role in Vienna. I'm sure he'd love to hear that if he's listening, uh, but he, he is very effective there. Yeah. No, yeah, that's, uh, no, I... I'm such a believer in Paul. In Paul. I, I went to uh, a conference uh, a couple months ago, and he I, he was speaking on a panel with a representative of the National Highway uh, Traffic Safety Administration NHTSA, and the National Sheriff's Association. And the most common single sentence uttered um, by by those two gentlemen combined was, "I agree with Paul," because um, because Paul did not fuck around. He came and and he. He had the the NHTSA book from the '90s that where where it said you know talking about impaired driving and there's no correlation between metabolic elements and and, and impairment, um and 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 he was quoting their organizations for over decades. Why? Because he does that silly thing. You know, he, again to quote him, I do this silly thing. I, I remember what I read. Um, so he he would be who I would nominate. All right, Councilmember right. Laughter. I think you had a follow up. No, not really. I was just going to make a comment that, particularly here in California, the opportunity to get arrested for media attention around cannabis. I don't know what I would have to do to get arrested for some activity with cannabis in California at this point. But and that's, that's a great, great problem to have. <laughs> well, and yet the California system is remarkably broken. Yeah. We, patients had good access at reasonable cost under Prop 215. Yeah. What was different about 215 and now is really we don't have legalization. We have commercialization. And the state yeah. now gets its cut and it's become extremely cumbersome and very destructive to most elements of the cannabis supply chain, but especially for patients. Again, yeah. I, I know I, I sound like a one message pony, but being a patient myself and many of the members of EAC uh, are among those who count on it for at least quality of life, if not yeah. more than that. And um, anyway, it's not really a question. It was just more of a putting out the putting out the truth, which is the only reason we have legalization, commercialization, decriminalization, call it what you will, is patience. Is yeah. the fact that this plant does in fact have really remarkable effects for certain medical conditions. And again, to turn it into a drug is a tragedy, but here we are. And, and you know, I, I think all of us are on this call, are really here because we wanna see this different. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's wrong morally and logically. It's, um, it's not dangerous. It does not have high, addiction, high potential for addiction. It, it needs to be descheduled, treated as a plant, not unlike growing peppers, for example, or tomatoes. Um, but I'm, I'm a hippie outlier on this and, and I know I'm not, in, I'm not the only one on this call that feels this way. 
Um, and really, we all want to see it change. And at the federal level is where that's going to happen. And so how can we, as the, again, mission driven, man, we know how to get shit done. We just need a scout, a pointer into the intricacies of politics at the national level. And yeah. we're certainly working at the state level in a number of states to change it there. Cause again, I think politics is really local, but, but the complication of trying to solve the federal schedule one thing at the state and local level is extraordinarily problematic and creates this insane patchwork you know you know as well as i do anyway i'll shut up that's all i got no no no, no. if 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 i may i i comment back in kind because i think you raised i mean you you succinctly raised a lot of the 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 real problems we have and i think that you know california in general a lot of of the underlying regulations that were included in 205 were were, were well intentioned but misguided and uh you're you're really smacking into a real problem when we talk about a consumer commodity right you know the, the you know talking about this as a plant it, 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 i mean it is a plant but it's it's a commodity because here in the united states we commodify everything including ourselves right and our labor is a commodity um our time is a commodity and and this plant is a commodity and when we think about the kind of interconnected supply chains and and the gravitation of capital to to make things uh to to consolidate things to to uh, accelerate efficiency reduce redundancies bottom line bottom line bottom line we have to return uh deliverables for our investors and you you smash that into just this this aspect where you know, I sitting here in Cleveland, Ohio, would be over the moon excited to be able to buy some some nice outdoor grown Northern California bud that, uh, at my local craft dispensary down the street. But I'm not going to be able to do that until the fall of federal prohibition, and it isn't until we try to figure out what interstate commerce looks like that, or what, once we start to figure out what interstate commerce looks like. Will we even truly have an idea of what this marketplace is going to be? You know, we are we are currently existing in what I like to refer to as the death rattles of prohibition. And, you know, so what what you knew between 1996 and 2016 was always going to be transitory. What we know from 2018 to today until federal legalization is transitory. And then there's going to be a probably really, really, really frustrating period right after federal prohibition. And depending on what kind of guardrails we put forth, um, you know, if you, if you haven't read uh, my, my, my colleague Shane title over at the Parabola Center and a former Massachusetts cannabis control regulator, she, uh, she has started her own project called the Parabola Center. And has done some really remarkable writing and, and policy work on preventing hyper consolidation and monopolization uh, once we federally deschedule. Um, because what I, I would be heartbroken to see, to to feel the kind of anguish that that I hear in in your voice about California nationally, and and I think that it is incredibly American for that to be the case. And, and I think that it's, it's incumbent upon all advocates and activists of all stripes to really be thinking hard about what, what post-prohibition looks like in, in, in the context of, of interstate commerce. Um, because it would be, you know, you, you, think, you think we have a hard time fighting one another in the advocacy space. Um, oh man, we're not gonna stand a chance compared to compared to some of, 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 of real corporate America when when they see a risk free opportunity to come in and make a buck. Um, and and that is that's that's the as I like to refer to as the end game. Um, right now we're just in this this frustrating transitory stage and it has real negative effects on real people every day. Um, but um, but this this too shall pass. Council Member Byrne, you had a follow up. Yeah, comment. 
I'll leave you guys alone with this one. But again, uh, all these years of lobbying, 80 years of injustice, all that shit is true. Uh, but I, you know, I just think uh, in the past, there's been a lot of wrong direction and it still goes on. Uh, my concept has always been this when it started that this is a plant that has beneficial therapeutic value and it's therefore it's a medicine and uh so it's a medicine so we got 550,000 medicines in the united states right now over the counter prescription 550,000 different stuff any one of us could get with a with a prescription and and some money but uh those decisions made about those drugs and those those prescriptions are all made by doctors and uh, pharmacists and registered nurses and PhDs. And so what Justin does, and this is where it just boggles my fucking brain, Justin goes over and he talks to lawyers and cops and judges about this medical issue. Excuse me, but what the fuck do they know about it? Justin keeps talking about the, the Democrats and the Republicans, and this guy needs to get reelected. Fuck them. My brothers and sisters are hurting. That's all I give a shit about. I don't care about whether these guys live in Minnesota or the moon. What we want as veterans is this bullshit to end. And the way to do it, I would suggest, is to give up on these fools. Let's go lobby the AMA. Let's get the ANA rejuvenated again. They're your buddies, by the way. We read my book. You get the AMA, lobby these bastards. They're supposed to be in charge of medicine, not some cops and robbers in DC. I will leave you with those thoughts. Justin, thank you so much for being here. It's been really an interesting conversation. Thank you. Yeah. That, thank you so very much, Councilmember. And and I, I was scrolling through some of uh, some of your past participants, and I noticed you had um, Brian from Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. And 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 I I'm not going to go to the AMA because they're not going to take me seriously. But I talked to to Brian, and Brian talked to the AMA. And and so I think you're 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 absolutely right. We got we should get the AMA. Um, I just I, I think it's a better use of his time than my my time, um, because, again, you know, for different audiences, you need different messengers and and um, again, the diversity of tactics. Right. Um, oh, Justin, we, I, we, I agree. And, and different audiences need different messengers. And you're, you're yes. cor absolutely correct. In, but but I'm just trying to emphasize to the audience out here that yeah. let's not forget about these groups. I mean, the yeah. AMA and the ANA supported me back in the year 2000. They let me have accredited conferences. So they've had 23 years of support. They just keep their mouth shut. But what we need the AMA to do is do what the American Nurses Association has does, is open their mouth. The ANA, yeah. to repeat this information, has twice issued white papers, essentially resolutions, that says if you're an RN in the United States of America, you must know about medical cannabis and how to administer it. We need the AMA to do a similar type of action. So anyway, that's what I'm telling the audience. I'm not, I'm not picking Wait, on you uh, and the other guys. No, 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 no. But you're, you're, you're. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because you just inspired me to ask uh, the council a question, if, if I may. Um, what can I get a vibe check on the National Association of Veteran Affairs, uh, Physicians and Dentists, the NAVAPD? Does that ring a bell to any of you? All right, so I'm going to harken back to one of the earlier questions, um, which is how can you work better with the Congressional Cannabis Caucus? Um, one, uh, one of uh, Congressman Blumenauer staffers reached out to me about two weeks ago. Uh, asking me if if I had known anybody at this at this institution, and then I called them up, talked to them a little bit about it, and and they said actually no, they just told us no, but so we're not going to have their endorsement on on our amendment push, but we should work on them going forward. Um, so if if I can so boldly suggest, I'll, I'm going to drop 
their website in the Zoom chat here, and if you guys could distribute it to to other folks um, to figure out the power structure of of how to get them to come on board with uh, medical cannabis reform at the congressional level, uh, it's it's the um, it's the association uh, again. That's the National Association of Veterans Affairs Physicians and Dentists, the NAVAPD. Uh, which is their website is just navapd.org. I dropped it to these folks, and I'm sure they'll drop it to to those who are watching and in the audience. I will drop it in the YouTube link as well. Perfect. Council Member Crowitz, you're recognized. Man, you, you've provoked a lot of thought. I appreciate you sticking around with us and uh, your your awesome. patience with us. Uh, a couple of quick things. Uh, uh, Dr. Adenoff, uh, Doctors for uh, Cannabis Regulation, actually was part of our delegation to Vienna uh, this last uh, uh, time over. And as a result of that, uh, attended a wrap up session, a behind the scenes session with the uh, Office of National Drug Control Policy, uh, at, you know, one of these White House meetings I was alluding to earlier. Um, and, and another little thing I'll just say what we're really focusing on at the international level and some of the stuff that we're doing at this we've been working a lot on interstate commerce we had a couple of round tables you'll see on interstate commerce um you know we're looking at almost like focusing on the day after legalization like the most of the movements focusing on the day before legalization where that's what we're focusing on is the day after so i'll say that um and uh um the the last thing i want to say is that california normal really helped us and uh, helped us with uh, a, an initiative that we had a single doctor do out in California to uh, work within the AMA, you know, uh, circles to pass a resolution to protect patients. It was one of a kind. I don't think it's ever been duplicated anywhere else. That has never been really lobbied at all to the uh, state, uh, the national group of state medical boards, which is, I think, a mm -hmm. very, very important target for that work. But also these uh, these particular uh, JAMA uh, you know groups or, or or areas around the country like the one in California that would be a great initiative to get some help with um, you know we we, we have uh, efforts to try to to connect these dots and and to do these things but it it really is difficult um, to get through kind of the armor um, if we have specific targets like the the this um, organization that you've dropped we'll we'll reach out mm -hmm. to them I assure you. No, thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, no, and 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 if I can, uh, just for for a moment, vibe, do a brain dump on on the status of some of the other veterans, the VSOs, uh, in Washington D.C. Just to share with you what I know. Um, and for for those of you tuning in, um, you know, showing up to the locals of these organizations if you aren't already, um, you know, to get. Uh, local, I know many, many locals have already passed resolutions, but the, the American Legion still refuses to substantively engage in this issue at the federal level. Um, IAVA recently went through a leadership transition and it is unclear to me as to whether or not it will continue to be a priority for IAVA. I see some heads shaking that seem to be confirming my suspicions, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm I don't want to lose hope yet. Okay, maybe I maybe I should just abandon hope. Um, all right, no, no, no heroes, no IABA. Um, so apparently, it sounds like uh, perhaps under under their new leadership, IABA is no longer going to be. They they, you know, one 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 thought, you know, is, uh, personnel is policy, right? You can have the greatest position statement on your website, but if you haven't empowered your your organization staff to to do any of the things that you're saying is your is your position then i don't really care what's posted on your website and 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 so often we see that with uh con, you know congressional leaders with with other organizations you know it's it, it's really the personnel who is going to be making these things happen and, and iava they they recently lost their staffer who uh was focused on cannabis and he's now at the uh, balanced veterans network i believe it is um um so shout out to victor uh he he was great um uh vfw still doesn't really want to lean in but i know they've 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 they're 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 better than most which isn't saying much um there's a few rogue ones out in california that are allowing and are yeah. trying to get you know allow yeah. cannabis use etc but we tried yeah. to actually rally around uh that and yeah we had no luck yeah. 
the American Legion or VFW. Yeah. Uh, even, yeah, it's mm -hmm. just very frustrating um, because uh, we we get individuals, but when it comes to brass or we hit the brass, then it's the individuals in the states that don't want to touch it. So it's yeah. a frustrating, sticky wicket that unfortunately we're going to see psychedelics gain more traction on uh, because of the ease than necessarily cannabis. But we don't necessarily know about IVA. I mean, uh, we, we don't know what mm -hmm. the actual change is because that change is still happening. So if uh, you get an idea which way the wind is blowing please let us know yeah. no I, I i certainly have been greatly appreciative of of their efforts they they for over the last few years and uh with their recent leadership change and personnel change uh, i just don't know yet um because it's really gonna be who shows up you know we yeah who shows up so so those are just a couple other thoughts um just to, to share with everyone to continue to agitate at, at every level and um and if anybody wants to run for the national board of american legion i i hear that uh you know they're they're, they're always looking for more people to participate so perhaps one one of you fine folks uh would be so interested in in trying to, to angle your way to the national board of the legion because I, I i think um if, 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 if we just got one or two major VFOs to, to really lay hands, like, you know, e even a group going back to an earlier question, you know, what, what could the Veterans Action Council do, you know, get absorbed by one of the major VSOs and, 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 and get them to say, hey, we want you to be a project of ours and you come in and you get full access to all of, all of our mechanisms of power and influence communications and everything, right? That, that would dramatically explode your 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 reach your and, and and your sphere of influence i know you know you might not like that idea but i'm just throwing it out there as as as, as a, <laughs> yeah no, i see uh, uh, way to fake it inside now um but just throwing it out there like th that that is one one tactic that, that um you know if if and when you had the, the option to consider it i think it'd be worth considering no, and that, that's a wise one as well. I'm going to go with Mount Council Member Krawitz and wrap things up. Yeah, man. Thanks again. Uh, you know, um, my brain just went totally blank. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. So the, 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 uh, we had sort of an inside edge with the American Legion. Um, we were working, it was, that's really something to work with that kind of power is really something. Uh, it was a single individual that uh, really was taken by the evidence presented by Dr. Sanjay Gupta when they did the big CNN and Sanjay Gupta reports on CBD and, and cannabis and spotlighted our buddy uh, Sean Kiernan, put him on the map with, uh, with his um, interview on that, on that show. But anyway, um, the American Legion ran with the ball and uh, really didn't face any flack for it or anything that I could see um, didn't really seem to adversely affect their relationships or anything like that. But nonetheless, um, they foreclosed on it. When I say they, the, the older vets and strong leadership positions came down on it really hard. Um, the fellow that was leading that effort, they sent to Siberia and they shut that shit down. They really don't want to look like they're, you know, even just to, to look, have the look. I mean, that's the thing. It's just, the, you know, cannabis is a look they don't want to be associated with. And, and the devil's arithmetic that they're applying, basically they're like, we have to have these strong relationships on a really dozen very, very important issues, ongoing discussions on veterans benefits and you know things that we're trying to work through. It's always an existential moment for the people working on veterans affairs when they're working with the, the uh, legislature. And um, that is really something that they leverage against this image of you know, possibly being tarnished or adversely affecting those relationships. And that's it. I mean, we, we've won the heart and souls of the uh, American Legion, the uh, uh, DAV, VFW, uh, IVA, Veterans for Peace, um, long, long ago. Um, but um, getting their leadership to either die out and be replaced or um, see the light is, I guess, our, our main goal. Yeah, and Vets gave me a, a Lifetime Achievement Award for cannabis, but where are they? <laughs> yeah. Well, nor here nor there. I would like to thank you, Justin. He is with the Better Organizing to Win Legalization or Bull Pack. I uh, cannot thank you enough for a fascinating discussion. Please come back, check in with us in the future. 
we appreciate what you're doing, but can't thank you for enough for joining us uh, for a very articulate and deep discussion. And uh, we'll carry it forward from here. I'd like to thank our council members, Peggy Jones, Kendra Soul, Brian Buckley, Al Byrne, Wade Laughter, Nate Landau, Michael Krowitz, and myself, Etienne Fontan. We'd like to thank you all for joining us for VAC's roundtable number 58, Justin Streckel. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.